my favorite, my favorite information I learned about in this whole course, and it was visible versus invisible support. This blew my mind because I, I never heard of this. Like, you're not going to hear this anywhere else. This is facts, knowledge, game. This is something that you have to do the research. You have to look at the research to figure out because you don't hear this anywhere else. Buddy, and welcome to Vibing Out with Texany. I'm your host, Texany, aka Mr. World Vibe. And what we have here is a community to give local voices a public platform of shared ideas, knowledge, and perspectives. So this is season two, Go Home, where majority of the episodes will serve as a guide for us to return home, but not just our physical house. Instead, ways of discovering and understanding the best version of ourselves, whether that be, you know, physically, emotionally, mentally, financially, or spiritually. So ladies and gentlemen, let's go home. And in this episode, this Psych Saturdays, let's go to the topic of intimate relationships. Uh, that is the course that I took when I was at York University. It was one of my favorite courses that I, that I took. I learned so much and I retained a lot of information too. I got a B plus in the course, okay? So I didn't do that bad. <laughs> and a lot of the information I remember to this day, I use to this day, I think about to this day. And so I'm really excited to like share the information with you guys. It's really relevant. We've all been in relationships. We've all had partners. We're all we're going to in some time, right? I hope, I mean, <laughs> hope you guys find somebody, but this is really relevant information. So you're going to take something away from this episode for sure. Okay, so yeah, I mean, this is just knowledge, this evidence-based research. It's not opinionated, it's facts. And so you can apply it to your life. I'm taking all the information I learned, or at least the interesting, really interesting information, and giving it to you guys for free. I pay for the course, not you. So yeah, I mean, I hope you guys appreciate this episode. And yeah, let's get into it. So what's going on in this episode? Let's give a little brief run through, okay? Mm -hmm. Number one, I'm gonna go over some of the information, the best parts of the lectures that I learned when I was in the course. I wanna give you the best information and you know, hopefully you enjoy that. Number two, I'm gonna be going over a paper that I wrote. And this paper, I did well, okay, I got an A on this paper, so I'm proud of writing it. I'm proud to share it with you. It's called Assessing the Current State of casual and intimate relationships. So I'm gonna be reading the entire paper verbatim, word for word. It was a good read and it's really relevant to the times today because it's about um, dating online, online dating apps like Tinder and stuff. It's, it's talking about how those have affected and changed the dating game, which is happening so much today because of the pandemic, we're using those apps and services so much more. So yeah, it was a really ahead of its time kind of paper and it's relevant and it's interesting to hear. So you'll like the perspectives in that as well. And lastly, I'm gonna be sharing with you guys 36 questions uh, to increase openness between you and someone else. So it brings two people together. These questions are proven to do that. And so I'm gonna share the questions with you. And so we'll get to all those three things today. And before we start, I just wanna say, you know, thank you, you're here with me. Uh, if it's your first time here, I appreciate that. Give this uh, podcast a subscribe on YouTube or follow and subscribe on Apple Podcasts and Spotify as well, however you're listening. Give this video a like, same thing. I appreciate those small gestures, they go a long way. So, you know, show your support, show love to those who love you. And yeah, whether it's your first time or your 50th time, I'm happy you're here with me today. So, so let's start with um, going through the lectures. My takeaways, my favorite takeaways from these lectures. We're gonna start with the beginning of a relationship, um, finding somebody, selecting a partner. And I think one of the most interesting parts of all this information, because I'm just picking out parts that I, that I found interesting, right? Is the three factors that influence attraction the most. So what are these three factors, right? Uh, there's a lot of things we can think about, but number one is similarity. How similar is your potential partner to you? 
and these are things like you know like social class religion faith uh, core values beliefs these are things that we actually look for in other people we want them to mimic us in, in these things it, it helps attraction i know people say i know opposites attract and there's not a lot of research that proves that i think that's more like as small aspects of a person that complement and go against what you are like, maybe extrovert, introvert, maybe those kinds of things. But on the most part, we look for people that can relate to us. So that's a big part of attraction. Number two is, is proximity. So we have an increased um, opportunity to meet and connect with those, you know, who we live, work or study around. And there's been studies to prove that to prove that you know you're more likely to get to know somebody if they're closer to you in proximity for example the mere exposure effect which just states that you know new stimuli in our lives novel stimuli we the more exposure we have to it the more we we see it the more we're around it we'll just end up liking it more and more as time goes think about that one person at work or in your school or something that you know you didn't like at first but then over time you started to be like okay you know what they're not that bad that's kind of what the mere exposure effect is so the people that are closest to us are people we're going to be attracted to and want to go towards anyways and the third thing the last part of of the most important factors to attraction is reciprocity which means somebody returning and reciprocating and being mutual with with feelings of attraction so you're more likely to be attracted to somebody who you know likes you too. That's that's basically what it is, um, and that and that makes sense, right? Why would you like someone that that doesn't like you? Actually, it, there is a thing. It's called unrequited love, um, and that happens sometimes. You know, sometimes we like people that don't like us back, and that happens sometimes. But most of the time, you're going to be attracted. If you know a person likes you, you're going to be attracted to them back most likely and so that's a big thing with attraction as well so similarity uh, proximity and reciprocity are the three most important factors to attraction okay another really cool concept that i that i really dig is the self-expansion theory which just means that you're looking to do things that expand who you are so if you're single you'll try new things you'll go outside of your comfort zone outside of your box and that's something i've done over the past year and brought me here to this podcast and it's helped me grown. And so if you do that with yourself, you're gonna be an attractive person if you're willing to self-expand. You bring that, I guess, characteristic into a relationship. If you meet someone and you're willing to try new things with them, you're willing to open up to who they are and make who they are a part of you, then you're gonna be attracted. That's how attraction is gonna happen. You can't just be yourself and never expect to be molded by the person that you spend time with. So self-expansion is a thing that increases attractiveness. Somebody that's willing to go out of their selves, include others in their identity. So now we'll talk about another part of this equation of relationships, staying together, you know, commitment and attachment, these sorts of things. And one big theory that we learned, it's basically the, the key tenet of what we learned in this class, in this lecture, was the interdependence theory. So think of it like this. If you're too independent, you're not gonna wanna be with someone. You're gonna be stuck in your ways. And if you're too dependent, I mean, that can be a bad thing too. So interdependent is kind of like finding a way to bring yourself with someone else in the middle. And one thing we have to do in this interdependence theory is weigh out a relationship. Is it worth it? We have to look at the ups, the downs, the costs, the rewards, okay? And this is actually what we do is we take the social exchange theory, which looks at rewards and costs, weighing out these, these ratios. We're going to use that theory, bring it into relationships. So rewards. What are some rewards that people give you in relationships? Tangible rewards, making you dinner, showing affection, or intangible things like feeling loved, feeling appreciated, knowing that your partner is dependable. These are rewards. These are things that we look for in relationships. Then there's costs. Mm, what's a cost? Um, partner lives far away, right? That's that's something we, we wouldn't want. Or has an annoying friend or family member that you have to be around. So we're going to weigh out the costs of relationships. And the formula is the outcome is the rewards minus 
whatever costs that there are for that given person. Interestingly enough, a man named John Gottman, he did some research into this and he found that costs to a relationship actually outweigh rewards. So five costs of, of a person of a relationship is equal to only one reward. And this actually increases after divorce. It's, it's anywhere from like eight to 10 costs equals one reward. So put it like this, you really like a person, you have a good connection, they're nice, they're generous, they make you feel appreciated, they're dependable, they're responsive, all these great things, but they live far away. So that one live far away part is gonna be equal to five good things about them. And so that's the kind of um, way you have to think about it. So now that we have our rewards and our costs and we know kind of this equation, the outcome is the reward minus the costs, we have to look past this simple social exchange theory. We have to do more than that because we compare our relationships, right, to our ideal situation in our head. That's called the comparison level. That's your subjective perspective. That's your personal idea of like what a great relationship is. So then we have to look at dependency because just because we're in a relationship and we're happy, we're satisfied, doesn't mean we're dependent, doesn't mean we're, it's a stable relationship. So there's one more factor and that's the comparison level of alternatives. So if you're not very dependent in a relationship, you're not gonna wanna stay. You're gonna start thinking about alternatives, right? Do I leave this person for somebody else or do I just leave this person to be single? So we have to look at our comparison level of alternatives as well. So our dependency in the relationship is gonna depend on the outcome. So what our relationship is minus the alternatives. So we're either stable or unstable, depending on our high dependence or low dependence. So to sum it up, right? High satisfaction means you're happy when the outcome of your relationship is higher than your comparison level. You're just comparing what the ideal relationship for you is. And at the same time, your dependency, right? You're gonna be stable in a relationship if the outcome is higher than all the alternatives you can think about. And it's gonna be unstable if the outcome is lower than the alternatives. And then there's four different types of dynamics because you have happy, unhappy, and you have stable, unstable. So now you can put yourself in this four categories of relationships. You can be happy and stable. This is the best situation that you can have. Your outcome is higher than your comparison level, right? And it's higher than your alternatives. So you're stable and happy. That's the best option. The worst one is when you're unstable and unhappy. So your outcome of your relationship is lower than your ideal, your comparison level, and it's lower than the alternatives out there. So I don't see anybody staying in this relationship. This is like a relationship that's doomed to end very soon. You know what I mean? And then there's unhappy, but stable. So you kind of have a positive and negative. So in this case, the outcome of your relationship is higher than your alternatives, right? So I mean, you're stable because you know, okay, this is an okay relationship, but you're unhappy because the comparison of your ideal relationship is higher than the outcome. And then the last one we have here is happy yet unstable. So in this case, you know, your outcome is higher than your comparison level. So you're happier than you would be without this person for sure. But you know that out there, there's something better. And so we sometimes stay in these relationships when they're unhappy, but stable or unstable, but happy. And so having this formula, weighing out these things, weighing out the rewards and costs, looking at your comparison level, thinking about the alternatives, helps you figure out where you are on this like spectrum, on this two axis spectrum. And maybe that will provide some insight into your dating situation to help you decide where you ultimately wanna be. So we're gonna talk about maintaining intimacy now, which is obviously something we need to do. And you know, responsiveness, being responsive to your partner is the most important thing responsiveness will breed is or is the kind of result of social support showing support to your partner and there's different ways of showing support so there's emotional support which means you can console your partner you can be there to listen to them that's just emotional support right there's esteem support where you're kind of you know reminding your partner of all their strengths and successes you know you're boosting their esteem and then there's instrumental support where you're giving advice or you're offering resources and then the last one is negative social support, which means you're being critical, invalidating the partner, putting them down. So this is the one you obviously don't want to do. 
And at the end of the day, we're all different in terms of what kind of support we, we appreciate. Uh, there's also the uh, five love languages, which, you know, has, that's been a thing that's been created, but we didn't really learn that in our research. So I, don't, I can't really speak on, on that as much when it comes to research. But at the end of the day, you have to know what your partner, uh, what kind of support they appreciate. So for example, for me, right? Maybe this is a generalization, but I'm a guy and I would appreciate instrumental support more than anything. Uh, advice, uh, resources, that's where I go to when I have mentors, for example. Um, maybe for, for women, they appreciate emotional support more. Maybe that's, so, you, but at the end of the day, it's a person by person thing, right? We can't just, we can't make generalizations, but we should know our partner at least and know what kind of support they need. So the support should be tailored to the person, obviously. Now, this was the my favorite, my favorite information I learned about in this whole course, and it was visible versus invisible support. This blew my mind because I I never heard of this. Like, you're not gonna hear this anywhere else. This is facts, knowledge, game. This is something that you have to do the research. You have to look at the research to figure out because you don't hear this anywhere else. And invisible, invisible support. They're both types of support. So, what is visible versus invisible support, right? Visible support is when the provider is giving support and the recipient of the support, they say, okay, yeah, they acknowledge that they were receiving support. So both sides agree support was given from the provider to the recipient. Fair enough. What's an example of this? Giving advice. So the person who's getting advice, they know that they're being offered support. They know that. Or if someone's having a bad time and someone says, you know what? Your, their partner says, you know, let me make you a nice meal. And it's weird because support visible support is actually detrimental to the recipient in a lot of cases so it actually has been known to increase feelings of of depression and anxiety because the person who receives the support they feel as if they need it they feel like they have to depend on this person that lowers their self-efficacy their belief in their own ability to reach success so they feel like they're a burden to somebody and that and they and they're thinking more about their stressors. They're thinking more about it because they're being reminded about it. So in a lot of cases, visible support can be a bad thing. When you tell someone, oh, you need some help. Let me get you some help. Let me help you out. Sometimes that doesn't work. And if you've seen that in your life, this, that's, this is why. But there is a, a better alternative. And so I'm going to give you that. And that's invisible support. Invisible support can bypass these negative experiences of visible support. And that means that the person receiving the support, the recipient, they don't know they're being provided support. They, they can't really perceive that. What's some examples of this? Hmm. If you're talking to somebody and you're subtly, you know, fixing their hair or like helping or adjusting them as they're talking to you, that's invisible support. Uh, doing acts of service uh, without them knowing. So if, you're, if your partner's stressed out and you know that their gas tank is empty before they leave to work, you fill it up. They might not even notice that they have a full tank of gas, but you supported them and you avoided the chance of them noticing, oh my God, I have no gas. Oh my God, oh my God. You, you avoided that by supporting them or you know, doing the dishes all the time at home and no one really notices, but there's never any dishes because you were doing that all the time. These are ways of offering invisible support and invisible support is the best way to provide support. You don't look to have validation that you're giving support you just do it so yeah that's that's support and that was one of my favorite parts of information that i learned so i hope you can find ways in your life to give invisible support this doesn't have to be in intimate relationships this can be in your household with your family you can support anybody with these ways of social support but and an extra something else that i heard i don't know where i heard this but i know it's true and i've done it myself is if you know someone's having a bad time they're going through some stuff they're not in a great mood you can support them. This is, I think this is a way of invisible support, actually. You ask them to help you with something because we all feel great. We actually feel better giving support. The research shows that, and this is actually in my course, that providing support is linked to lower mortality, more than su receiving support. So isn't that weird? Giving support, it lowers your chance of dying and receiving support really has nothing to do with that. So if someone's having a bad time, right, and you can tell their, their mood is down, ask them for help. And if they can help you with something that, you know, they're good at, that, that they have no problem helping you with, that'll increase their mood. So it's kind of like a kind of psychology hack, but 
it works. I've done it myself, so consider that. Now let's get into sexuality, okay? We gotta go there, okay? That's a part of relationship. That's a part of intimacy in any level. And so I just wanted to speak on a few parts that kind of stood out to me. The first thing here is, is how many times um, couples, partners should have sex per week? Like how many times do they need to have sex where satisfaction is, I don't know, maintained? And it was interesting because a few studies have shown that you don't need to have it more than once a week for it, for it to increase you know satisfaction in a relationship. But if you don't have it once a week, if you're not having sex weekly, it leads to lower feelings of satisfaction. So it the research kind of shows one time per week is the perfect amount that prevents lowering your satisfaction. And if you have sex more than once a week, doesn't really affect satisfaction at all. In fact, there's a study here that they, they made participants in the study double their sexual frequency and it did not improve their sexual their satisfaction in their relationships. Sometimes it actually lowered their happiness, lowered their satisfaction. And so yeah, that's interesting. You don't really need to have you don't really need to, you know, have sexual interactions more than like once a week for any aspects to really change in a relationship. I thought that was interesting. Also, why you have sex matters. Um, you want to do that to increase intimacy, not to avoid conflict. So yeah, I mean, you have to be clear about the intentions of why you're doing it. And another part uh, that we learned in this research is a lot of it is just responsiveness. You, you have to kind of go into it like you want to give to your partner. You want to see them happy. You want to please them. And they need to want to do the same thing to you. So it has to be very mutual for sexual interactions to really increase satisfaction, to increase the intimacy and to maintain that. You have to be willing to give and your partner has to be willing to give as well. So that's just another thing that in the research that I'm sure you guys know. And how do we keep um, sexual satisfaction, keep intimacy over time in a relationship? Because, you know, we think about long term relationships, marriages, and a lot of us will think and will see that satisfaction declines over time, right? That's that's kind of true. That's what the research shows, but there are ways to prevent that. Number one is novelty, doing new things. That's the self-expansion theory we talked about earlier. So let's say if you go on a date with your partner, you guys go to the movies every Friday or you go out to eat every Thursday. What you wanna do is do things you both haven't done. If you guys have never done a paint night before, Go to a paint night. If you've both never been, I don't know, hiking, go hiking together. So doing new things creates a bond because you're both expanding on who you are together. So self-expansion, uh, doing not new things, novelty is a great way. Introducing new things into a relationship is always a great way to keep and maintain the intimacy and responsiveness, right? Emotionally, responsiveness to sexual needs, being responsive, actually listening, understanding and being able to you know communicate effectively obviously that's going to be a huge part because relationships are bound for conflict that's the last part we're going to go to is conflict right it's a part of relationships it's undeniable so how do we learn about conflict so we can move through it effectively i think one of the most interesting parts is what do couples fight about the most there were studies that looked into this and i asked it on the on the instagram quiz so this might not be that surprising, but the topics of children, household tasks, and communication are the three highest uh, rated areas of conflict in relationships. And that kind of makes sense because when you live with a person or when you have kids with somebody or both combined, you're going to have disagreements. You're going to have things to work on, challenges to work on. So yeah, those are the biggest things. And then communication as well. So you don't have to be living together or having kids to know that communication saves relations. I think Drake said that. <laughs> and so these are the most important things. When you think about time spent at work, money, habits, friends, personality, those things were all lower compared to the top three things, children, household tasks, and communication. So, so if you're just getting together with somebody and you think about what are the possible conflicts at the height of just getting together with somebody, communication will always be the most important thing before you move in together, before you have kids together, communicate effectively, find ways to do that. And let's go deeper into this conflict because how we communicate our conflicts, our disagreements 
will be the ways to work through these inevitable conflicts effectively, right? So there's four types of conflict that, at least that we learned in our research, and they're the, I guess the most common, I'm sure there's other ways, but let's look at these four. Number one is criticism, attacking a person's character or, or personality. Then there's contempt, which is one up from criticism. It's actually worse than criticism because you're just showing disgust, hatred uh, for a person. You're, you're acting like you're superior to them. This shows as, you know, rolling eyes, being sarcastic, these sorts of things. There's defensiveness, which is, you know, deferring responsibility, making excuses. There's been that as well. And lastly, stonewalling. This was one that you might not have heard of, but you've probably experienced. And this is just when you exit a conversation, when you just withdraw from the interaction. And think about dating online, right? You don't have to be really in a conflict, but let's just say you're talking to somebody online and they stop talking to you. They ghosted you. I want to argue that that is a form of stonewalling because if there's any disagreement or if one person feels like, oh, I don't know what to say, their communication is going to be peace. That's a very, obviously, that's not a fun way of communicating. That can be toxic. That can be, that just doesn't help a, a relation at all. It doesn't help the communication at all. But for a lot of people, that's the easiest thing to do is to just peace. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's also a way of dealing with conflict that's, you know, not constructive. So there's different ways you can deal with conflict that put you in a kind of spectrum, kind of like we did with relationships and weighing out, you know, the outcome, the cost, the rewards, the satisfaction, all like that. We're going to do the same kind of thing with how we deal with conflicts. So if you have a conflict with somebody, you can be active or passive. You can be active, you know, use your voice, say, hey, you know what? I don't like the way that you did this. I'm upset at this. That's active. And that's active constructive because you're doing something you're communicating effectively. So then there's constructive or destructive. So, so you have to think about it like active and constructive, which is like I said, communicating your feelings. Hey, I'm upset at this and that. That's the best thing you want to do. The worst thing you want to do is be passive and destructive, which is just like neglect, not listening to the person, not doing anything, sitting there, just not doing anything. Um, if you want to be active and destructive, you can leave the situation. You listen to them, you heard what they said, but you're going to leave the situation because it's a heated conflict. You can't do anything constructive in this case, so just leave, exit. Um, and then there's constructive passive. So you want to do something, but you can't do anything. So you're just going to sit back and just be there for them. And that's kind of like what loyalty is. So if you have a friend that you love, you care about, you can't really help them but you're always willing to listen and say nothing, but just listen to them and be there for them. Okay, that's a form of, that's a way of dealing with conflict. Just being, is just being loyal to a person. So there's different ways of dealing with conflict as well. So we really went through relationships, getting into relationship, maintaining intimacy. Uh, we looked at sexuality, conflict. So I hope a lot of these ideas are applicable to your own relationships being with partners and I hope something here kind of resonated with you and you can use it going forward and it helps you. And now I'm pleased to share with you the paper I made um, in this course. It's called Assessing the Current State of Casual and Intimate Relationships. So let me just read it word for word. Let me know what you thought about it, okay? Is Tinder the death of love? Despite the fact that this online dating app has sparked 10 billion relationship matches since 2016, the state of romantic relationships seem to be at risk. Almost everyone has used Tinder, if not heard about the app, making it arguably the most popular approach to dating in today's generation. The company's original intent, according to Fabevra, which is a source I used, was to create an online sphere for people to foster romantic relationships. However, this is not what the platform use, is used for today. When Tinder users were surveyed, it was found that over 50% of participants believed the app was made for hookups. This isn't surprising due to the app's interface of swiping to reject or accept connections, mainly dependent on physical attractiveness. Unfortunately, commitment is more important 
than physical connection for romantic relationships. So Tinder might not be contributing to commitment due to the user ability to foster numerous and simultaneous relationships. The pervasive hookup and casual sex culture is very similar to that of the long existing friends with benefits relationships. Being a blend of friendship and physical intimacy, friends with benefits uh, also does not contain labels or implied commitment. When Owen and Fincham, another study, examined emotional reactions in different types of relationships, they found friendship and romantic partners were associated with psychological well-being. On the other hand, ambiguous romantic relationships such as friends with benefits and hooking up were related to psychological distress. That being said, it's not so crazy to suggest that these casual interactions Tinder creates could lead a person to negative emotions. To avoid problems, individuals engaging in casual sex and hookups should be conscious and thoughtful about their decisions. After all, only about 10% of friends with benefits relationships develop into committed relationships. If we're going to accept that Tinder's here to stay, we cannot deny the powerful influence that technology has had on the ability to seamlessly connect us. Whether two people are just connecting, friends with benefits, hooking up, or in an intimate relationship, it is true that couples use technology to stay together. Relatedness was the most important aspect, according to Hazenzal and others, another study, that kept two people connecting over physical distances. And they offered six strategies to maintain relationships. If two people want to truly work towards sustained intimacy, practicing awareness, expressivity, physicalness, gift giving, joint action, and memories are essential, along with commitment, obviously. Even though some of these categories are harder to achieve through online communication, uh, such as physicalness, gift giving, or joint action, it is a step forward. If couples and dating services alike know what factors lead to successful romantic relationships. After assessing the current state of relationships, it is clear that online dating apps such as Tinder influence this hookup and lack of commitment culture. For those who want to partake in these friends with benefit uh, type scenarios, we've discovered that conscious and clear decision making can be the difference between positive and negative emotional reactions to casual relationships. For those who are still looking for lasting love, using technology to uphold relatedness in relationships is optimal. Humans will continue to connect on a physical and intimate level. Perhaps knowing what is and isn't working is advantageous for all kinds of relationships. And yeah, that's the paper. And I think it's very relevant because we've seen dating apps just come out on the rise. We, we know that Tinder exists. We know that, what are the other ones? There's other ones, I don't know. There's other ones, you, you know the other ones. I don't use dating apps, I, I really never have, but they're out there, people use them. And it just makes you think like, you have to have your intentions really set on what you want because you can see in the research that casual hookups for the most part lead to psychological distress at some point if a person is not clear on their intent going into a you know um, encounter with the person right and uh yeah let's move on to the last part of this podcast so i have this document here that our prof gave us and it's 36 questions that increase closeness so what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to ask each question to eat like back and forth go one by one because they get increasingly more personal. And by the end of the questions, uh, people in this and study, I guess, they reported feeling closer, much closer to their partner, whoever they were asking the questions with and to. So let's look at some of these questions to just give you like a flavor of what these are kind of like. Question number one, given the choice of anyone in the world, whom would you want as a dinner guest? Simple question, right? That's not that hard to answer. You're just getting started. If I look at question 17, right? 
what is your most treasured memory? So that's gonna make you have a longer answer, a very personal answer. And then if we look near the end, question 30, when did you last cry in front of another person? By yourself? Like, when did you last cry with someone else and by yourself? So this is a question you gotta be pretty vulnerable to answer, right? So these questions, I'm gonna actually give you all the questions, okay? There's a link in the description of this episode. Check out the questions, copy paste them onto your phone. Next time you're meeting a person or the person that you're with right now, if you're in a relationship, ask your partner, do the questions, see what happens, see how you feel at the end of them because the studies show you'll feel closer. So want to leave you with that. And as well in the description of this episode is the link to my Patreon. I hope you'll join that. That's where you're gonna get exclusive content behind the scenes to episodes and a discount on my upcoming book, How to Vibe Out. It's coming out April 1st. So it's pretty soon, guys. I'm almost done writing it as I record this. I'm excited to give more previews. So get on the Patreon if you want to be a part of the previews and that exclusive community. And thank you to everybody who's on there already. So big thanks to everybody who's just here watching, listening. Um, I really enjoyed doing this episode. It was really fun. I hope you learned something. Let me know what you thought about it, guys. The feedback is everything to me. Just, it's more than the numbers. It's more than the money. It's more than the Patreon. It's more than anything. It's just hearing how you guys liked the episode, what you learned, how it affected you. Let me know, okay? So, yeah, I'm gonna get going. I'm gonna work on editing this episode, get it out to you guys as soon as I can. Hope you enjoyed it. And I'll see you next time, okay? So this has been Vibing Out with Texany. I'm your host, Texany, a.k.a. Mr. World Vibe. And I'm signing out. Peace.